Thank you for listening to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast from CityWorks Expo. Before we get to today's episode, we want to take a quick moment and let you know that CityWorks Expo 8, anticipating 2050, acting today, uh, will be occurring October 4th through 6th in Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, we've got some really exciting speakers and some other activities lined up that we're excited about. If you all are interested, please check us out at CityWorksExpo.com. That's CityWorksXPO.com. But now, without further ado, let's get on to today's episode. Please listen carefully. Welcome to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast from CityWorks Expo. My name is Brad Stevens, and I'll be your host today. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to our guest, Mr. Chuck Wolf, founder and principal advisor for the Seeing Better Cities Group and author of Seeing the Better City and Urbanism Without Effort, uh, and also a longtime uh, Seattle lawyer before he got into this work. But how are you doing today, Chuck? I'm doing great, Brad. Thanks so much for having me on today. Of course. It's, it's a pleasure to have you in from Seattle. And I know you've got many travels coming up, but I, I wonder if you could share a little bit about how you define the work you do and what you're up to. Well, that, that relates to travel, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, the short story, I think, is that that um, the idea of really immersing oneself in a city and understanding its context probably is in my blood. Um, my father was an urban planning professor, and as I say in both of my books, had a substantial influence on what I've done. And you're correct. I mean, for the majority of my career, I've been a land use lawyer, land use and environmental lawyer in both Connecticut and um, my hometown of Seattle. I started writing about cities on the side in 2009, and that's kind of taken me over. And to cut a long story short, um, I'm less a lawyer now and more um, a consultant and speaker and researcher and am really now headquartered in London doing the types of things that I think we're going to talk about. Um, I'll conclude by saying that what's really on my mind about what I do right now is that I'm about to go to um, north eastern Australia, to Queensland, to the towns of Cairns and Townsville to test out the ideas from seeing the better city on the ground in small tropical Australian cities um, as part of a Fulbright grant. Um, and we're going to have a United Nations um, World Urban Campaign, Urban Thinkers Campus, um, which I'm very honored to say are, are built around the ideas in the book. So seeing that I leave in about a week, that's what I'm doing right now. And um, then I'll be back in London and Sweden, where I'm also doing some work and back and forth to Seattle over the, the, the next many months. There's so much to dig into there, but it's, you know, I think... Uh, I want to start with the beginning in some ways, and that is, you know, this the book and this kind of idea of urban diaries and observing and shared experience and, and, and documenting experience and kind of can you distill for for folks what it means in your mind to see the city and what's what's involved and how to do that in a in a, in a thoughtful and, and structured way? Yes. Um, thank you. I. It's important to define where this came from, and that is, after many years in the trenches as a, as a lawyer, largely in the private sector, but often representing municipalities as well with complex redevelopment projects, brownfields, other constrained properties, that kind of thing, I, I began to see patterns in um, human conduct. And I realized that so much of what we talk about in the language of the law or the language of adv- adv- advocacy and politics might be influenced by something else. And that is what we see, what we smell, what we feel when we are in, of course, both natural and urban surroundings, but particularly urban surroundings where I was working. And I thought, and I'm certainly not the first person to think this, but I, I may be among the few lawyers who <laughs> ran with this idea that wouldn't it be great if we found a way to speak more visually and if we helped everyone and this, I, I mean this in an empowering way, not just developers doing community meetings, or, uh, but we helped everyone 
understand the basis for their reaction to a given change around them. Why do you say on a knee-jerk basis, no, that's too tall? What's going on? And I've used my hometown of Seattle as a foil because, as you know, there's so much change in Seattle um, driven by Amazon and a long history of boomtown companies going way back to, well, the Alaska Gold Rush wasn't a company, but Boeing was. <laughs> and uh, we can take that through Microsoft, Starbucks, <laughs> Costco, and all the rest, and now Amazon. I've used Seattle as a foil to explore those ideas because I've seen in a progressive city everyone trying to be more progressive than everyone else and, quite frankly, a lot of massive dysfunction. So that was one that was one driver. Now, to your point, what does this all mean? What's an urban diary? It's a scalable approach. It's part of what I call very acutely, I think, the lens method, look, explore, narrate, and summarize. It's forced immersion. It's a number of prompts in its simplest form to learn how to see the places where one lives and works. And there's a there's tip sheets that are available, um, pretty standard fare that take your medium of choice. Mine is a camera. Mine is visual. But it doesn't necessarily need to be, but take that medium and force yourself to look, explore, narrate, and summarize. And um, they're, they're in Seeing the Better City are a range of urban diary types. Um, I take it all the way from the most simple exploration for someone learning how to see, um, all the way up to some model regulations and approaches that uh, planning planning, and, 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 and other officials could use to begin to build this approach into community involvement. I want to be very clear. Um, some people think it's fluff. Some people think it's second-tier stuff that we don't have time for. Some people think it's journaling. Yes, it, it, it could be that, but it's, it's more really aiming at the core of our urban issues today and trying to find another way to address them. It's a bit of system reinvention, I think, really. Hmm. You know, that brings to mind, as, as someone who did qualitative research in graduate school, that there's still a stigma in, in the academia towards qualitative data, and that's really what this is about in some ways, is taking, you know, instead of let's just look at the numbers, let's break down into experiences and slow down and break down assumptions in some ways, isn't it? Um, yeah, I mean you're right on to sort of the inductive methodologies versus the deductive methodologies if we raise this up to a social science level. And um, I have encountered that, but you know, the reviews in the academic journals have given me largely a break on that because I think they do see the value of trying to intersperse the human with the uh, data-driven. And um, I'm beginning to do new work as part of um, one of my ongoing obligations, which is a part-time visiting scholar role at the Royal Institute of Technology in uh, Stockholm, um, we're beginning to do some research on uh, what we call cities in context and trying to figure out a way to further infuse the human scale into the data-driven um, in a way that's different than some of the public life studies and uh, place-making approaches that have um, that are already out there. Uh, the smart city movement, and I'm not the only one to say this, there's a lot, of, a lot of folks who are reacting this way. The smart city movement needs to be sure it incorporates the humanistic. And I've done a lot of thinking about that, at least during my travels over the last six months in particular. But yeah, you're right on. There, there is, in some circles, a bit of a, a discounting of um, what is so important. I wouldn't say um, social science and academia are the only circles. I think um, certain, if I may, certain people, often my friends in the um, built environment professions and the planning professions um, also discount it because they don't necessarily give enough credit to people 
for their ability, their latent ability to see. We all see. And it just, it all depends on who's looking at what from which angle. And we need to honor the fact that, that everyone can do that um, in, in ways that um, aren't just the photo walk, aren't just the, um, the, the shutter clicking itself, but takes that and puts it to good use in public process. Um, one thing I've found is that developers actually, some of my former clients, uh, developer clients like the idea. Um, it's not anything that is public sector versus private sector. Um, um, it isn't just not in my backyard folks who can use this technique. Um, so, yeah. Do you think that some of that difficulty from, you know, urban planning folks and folks in that field is that there is inherent in that field, a, a, a collective looking at things. And in some ways we forget to look at the individual perspectives in, in light of that collective nature of planning. Uh, and that sometimes we need to find that balance. Is that what you're striving for in some ways with this? Yeah. Yeah. I think you, I think you've encapsulated it quite well with a, with that choice of words. I also think that people are people in the, um, you know, in, in, in the planning departments in larger cities are so process driven and they, they don't feel they have room for this. They don't feel they have time for it in a city like, say, you know, I mentioned my hometown of Seattle, but there's so many around the world where things are changing so quickly. Uh, the questions I get are, we don't have time for that. I mean, what what's the platform? Huh? You know, this is just going to be delay. And well, that's fine. But then if you're not giving people a chance to um, express themselves um, in ways that aren't quite frankly manipulated by a pre-assembled set of questions or a pre-assembled visual preference survey, then you're going to make things worse. And what I found fascinating, we were talking about this a little bit before we went live, is this idea, um, these ideas that I'm putting out there um, seem to get a lot of, um, a lot of reception across the various oceans <laughs> and um you know I, I i a lot of kind people have allowed me to speak and quasi consult here in the u.s but um the places i really see a sort of synergistic response are, are uh, australia portugal you know some of the work i've done and then doing in sweden uh, recognition already in the united kingdom that i didn't ask for there's something uh, inherent in our political, our socio-political system here in the United States, which is um, going to push down the priority of this kind of approach and box it off into one subset of community involvement. Um, when in fact, as I argue in Seeing the Better City, it could be far more of a holistic um, approach and it also sets the stage by it i mean let's just say assembling a range of images it, it it if you flip it to the smart city and data driven side this stuff can be data mined and the inputs are always human whether it be you know millions of instagram photos taken in a given city versus the coffee table photograph on on you know, on seeing the better cities cover. The reason there is a uh, a photo of Paris on the cover of the book is to point out that um, that same photo, which is in the, in the uh, looking uh, quasi telephoto view of two people crossing the street looking at the Paris Opera House, that could be a coffee table photo, or it could be uh, one of um, thousands of photos in that area of Paris to sh that could be data mined to show. Um, that there aren't enough um, good crosswalks. Um, the, the range of possibilities for uh, citizen input that's visual, especially in the age of smartphones and Instagram, Facebook at all, is, is tremendous. And um, what I find when I run around talking about this stuff is there aren't that uh, many people who are simpatico with my point of view that's the, that get, I think you articulated that I'm looking for a middle ground here. I'm looking for a fine balance. People tend to go off into the 
data-driven world or the human inductive world. And, and I'm trying to marry the two, which isn't easy. <laughs> hmm. Well, it's interesting that you'd have, in some ways, more trouble in my mind in the U.S., given that this is a culture that's so driven by individualism in some ways that uh, to the detriment of our country sometimes. And yet when we it's hard for us to take the time to slow down and listen to individual perspectives on things. Yep. I mean, I couldn't agree more so far, although I have seen, you know, I have seen some some groups in some smaller cities um, um, attempt to implement um, some of some of the ideas that I've put out there. They're they're not new. They're just presented in a different way. Um, And um, I don't want to certainly cast a um, a negative uh, or cynical approach on all of this. I'm trying to describe my experience. It may be that people still see me as a lawyer. They're saying, what the heck is a lawyer (laughs) out there talking about taking pictures uh, about? Um, But uh, I will say that, you know, um, this is just a factual report that, um, you know, and and it's obviously on my mind because I'm about to travel to, to, an area of Australia that is um, interested, really interested in testing this out. And it was worthy of funding by the Australian American Fulbright Commission and, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's another way of looking at this, I think, and that is that, um, that, that, that amplifies your own curiosity. And that is that we all are taking photos at such a, such a rapid pace now with, my previously alluded to reference to smartphone technology, Um, the landscape architecture professor, Ann Weston Spurn, who's done a lot of work with photography and in, in, in her uh, writing and teaching as well notes. And I believe I quote her that, you know, never in human, modern human history have we taken so many photographs but we do so little with them Mm. and it's ironic because to your point about individualism people are always out there showing their stuff on social media (laughs) beyond selfies they're showing they're they're showing you know urban scenery that they have an inherently positive reaction to or sometimes a negative reaction to and, and i'm saying can't we be a little more organized about this as some people are i don't want to say nobody's doing this because i have several examples in chapter five of the book um, of, of cities around the world that are doing this and have used citizen input um, in a variety of ways in their planning processes you know visual so vi- visualizations from citizens but um can't we do a better job of organizing our instagram <laughs> you know, uh, shots, and especially when they're um, of a of an evocative urban place or an urban scene that's very disturbing. Hmm. This is really you've got me thinking here in terms of. Um, I have a another podcast I'm recording coming up with a woman who's written uh, Alexandra Lang, who has written a book about the design oh, of, of, of childhood and how. Uh, if we design yeah. things around children, it can change everything. I'm just thinking, you know, from my personal experience, I have a nine month old. And so, of course, my phone is full of pictures of my nine month old. Uh, and if yep. people were to see that, they would it would give them a clear sense in some ways of what my priorities are uh, that would then allow right. the city or the municipality to know in some ways how to direct uh, action in terms of what knowing what that input is for me. And it's, it's, a, it's fascinating to think from that personal perspective. Uh, oh yeah. And I, and thank you for that. I, I, I have heard, you know, I've been on in other interview settings where, um, people once the door is open, make some more conclusions. So I promise you if seeing the better city is revised, there'll be a new form of urban diary <laughs> that uh, speaks to, uh, you know, the urbanism perspective of the visual urbanism perspective of babies in the urban environment. Well, Alexandra, (laughs) who I do not know personally, is incredibly well known. And um, it'd be interesting to see if she's even aware of seeing the better city, because we are, you know, that gets down to silos. And she is, um, 
She has sponsored and um, written herself some really, really amazing stuff. And um, um, but I'm not an architect. I'm not an I'm, I'm not. A, I, I am a quasi academic. I'm not an academic, and so it takes a while for all of us within our various circles to even talk to each other. Um, there are other books out there right now that take on this issue from other perspectives. Sarah Goldhagen's book um, in particular, um, and she and I have corresponded at least. But um, I, I think another important point, and you probably address this all the time, because I've, as I've said, I've listened to many of your podcasts and you you really have such a fine choice of people you've spoken to. Um, you know, you must wonder, wow, these two should know each other. They're saying the same thing. <laughs> and that's another inherent problem of um, our society these days. We've got multiple towers of Babel going on where, you know, people are clamoring to get to the top, speaking different languages. We'd like to take a moment now to say thank you to our sponsors today. The Urban Affairs and Planning Program at Virginia Tech School of Public and International Affairs offers an interdisciplinary approach to understanding planning and policy for mega regions, cities, suburbs, and rural regions in the U.S. and abroad. UAP faculty have expertise in urban planning, architecture, urban design, economics, geography, political science, law, technology, and engineering, and provide students with a multifaceted understanding of how communities grow and change. Students supply their knowledge and professional skills by participating in real-world problem-solving with community clients through project-based studios and applied research. UAP emphasizes technical analysis and policy evaluation in approaching the complexities of modern communities. So a big thanks today to the Urban Affairs and Planning Program down at Virginia Tech for being our sponsor. If you'd like to hear more, check them out online. But without further ado, we'll get back to today's guest. Thank you. You know, it's it's true enough. And I think that one of the things that I find most compelling about work in this urbanism space or whatever we want to call it, you know, is that it, it has to be comprehensive. And so you wind up, uh, you know, talking about uh, in any given conversation, everything from education to housing to transportation and everything in between and it's uh it's part of what makes this yeah. fascinating and it's i think you know when we talk about tools like your own it's what makes them in my mind so fascinating is that they're so flexible that they can be used in any of those spaces to tell all kinds yeah. of different stories well I'm, I'm of course you know a total believer in what you've <laughs> just said and 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 um i have i just returned from an urbanism conference and had you know had some very very similar responses in listening to some of the presenters and um i think there's another there's another element of that it's it's really people people these days tend to um absorb their news and perspectives from at most 800 word social media pieces mm. And as we all know, often from 100 some characters, or now that Twitter's expanded to 200 <laughs> some characters, and um, I think that is um, discounting and jeopardizing um, our comprehensiveness. Uh, I've learned a lot about how people take short shrift and responses and run with them. I was speaking to someone who's very involved as a climate change consultant the other day. Um, and she was beginning to explore the possibilities of using some of the methodology in my book for her own work. And it was news to her that it wasn't just a book about how to look, see pretty things in a city. Hmm. And um, I think that's because people it's not just it's not just the immersion in the urban environment. It's immersion in ideas and other works about the urban environment as well that, that people often don't do. Well, I'm intrigued, kind of, to build on that and then uh, take it kind of back into your your particular work. And that I think one of the things that I find most interesting is that you know obviously 
we all bring a different set of experiences and we all take uh, observe things in different ways so w when I'm looking at something it may be a very different way from how somebody else to s sees something but at the same time like often for us to move forward as a community we have to have a kind of shared vision and create something together as to what we want to do moving forward so how do we kind of take that those differences in observation and experience and combine them into creating some kind of shared vision to move forward standard podcast answer that's a very good question. Uh, <laughs> and I think that um, what what I have been arguing um, is that, one, we need to acknowledge the sort of comprehensiveness that you and I have been talking about. Number two, we have to have faith in um, everyone's ability to contribute mm -hmm. to the conversation in a way that's a bit more self-starting. Some would say that, well, the community needs guidance. You just can't. I spoke to a local politician and developer um, in the Puget Sound area, the Seattle area, about all this about a year ago. And he basically said, well, you just can't ask Mrs. Smith to go out and with her camera without guidance. It's like, yes, but the guidance can be subtle. It can be empowering and it can be non-threatening. And so to your point, um, it's not that everyone, you know, every stakeholder in the urban development, redevelopment, affordability, community involvement game isn't sensitive to what you've just said. Oftentimes cities, private entities and whatnot will go beyond the architect or the lawyer and engage, of course, a public involvement consultant and work on these very issues. Um, I say from the perspective of someone who has been in the trenches as a lawyer, arguing pros, cons, and seeing these human reactions, that um, we have to be careful not to pre-digest too much. Mm -hmm. And um, for instance, I alluded to this already, Let's assume there's a great idea about a placemaking type idea about um, re-energizing a corridor and making it walkable and appealing and de-emphasizing the automobile and greening it up and having attractive street furniture and you know all of the things that are of great currency today, making it bikeable. Um, lessening the seams between the private property and the public realm, you know, all that stuff. Do you do it in a way that you have, you know, a set of consultants who come at 7.30 next Tuesday night for this listening session, but essentially come with their, their poster boards and their whiteboards and their renderings and their proposals and get reactions or do you somehow enable the citizenry to submit their own thoughts even if it's a little bit random and i of course am trying to explore the latter and that's certainly what we're going to be doing in australia in the next few weeks and we've got a whole set of guidance for attendees about what they can do. Um, I don't believe we're giving enough credit to people who are not everyday participants in these discussions to meaningfully participate. Now, this is um, something that has been attempted as part of the charrette process in, you know, that was has been championed within the new urbanist communities of, um, of professionals. And um, that's great, um, but we, we, we need to be forever mindful of the consultant ego and tendency to pre-digest. And this is where I think the energy needs to be. And we need to help people look at what's good in their cities and what's problematic 
and as I said earlier, to understand why they respond the way they do. Um, I spend a lot of time in, the, in seeing a better city showing um, the less pleasant, how homelessness appears around the world. I talk about what a healing area of a city looks like after a terrorist attack. I mean, th this is the city too, and we need to we need to have a we need to acknowledge a, a wide range of, of of issues. And I think what I'm trying to say is that the path of least resistance, when there's professional curation of these issues, is a pre-digested presentation to the public. Certainly, people are thinking about defensive space now, right? I mean designing so that cars can't, you know, drive into pedestrian streets, putting tasteful, you know, making the bollards pretty, that kind of thing. But why not let people participate in their, on their own with only nominal guidance um, and go out with their smartphones and submit to a common email address or portal um in a way that that is i think more authentic so this is where i'm concentrating it's not a complete answer to your question and the lawyer in me has even tried as i said in chapter five of seeing the better city to write some regulations that might encourage that the only um well i've seen cities i, I i've also said earlier that you know i have seen some cities um try and take this seriously and, and um, there's some examples in the book but when I was in Australia last time in October um, I gave a talk to the planners um, for the state of New South Wales and Sydney um, and some remote outposts that were on the phone or you know in a webinar context and it was really cool and I got a couple of calls immediately from lawyers within the department um, very, very interested in how this might be integrated into some public involvement mm. bylaws, regulations that they were working on. And I'm not quite sure what happened. I had to tell them, uh, you might read the book and not just run with that PowerPoint I use. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but anyway, I, I think I've at least mostly answered your question. <laughs> What's interesting to me, it really brings out this this kind of philosophy that I try and live by and, and, and do in my own work, which... I don't know if I've ever shared this on the podcast, so you're bringing this out of me, but the, I kind of operate from this principle of we don't know the answers yet to the big questions that we see in our world. And so I think what uh, what I find so compelling in some ways in hearing that from you is just this idea that you know if we take a step back and instead of going in and presenting plans to be looked at or thinking that we know how to deal with the street or something, that if we take a moment and really listen to folks and see what folks are, are visualizing or, or saying out loud that that allows us to break down assumptions and really it, it allows a space for some fairly radical trust to form and some, some new ideas to potentially pop up from that discussion in that space where, in my mind, we need more of that experimentation and those new ideas to come to the table because, as I said, I'm not sure that these these ideals that we have right now are the ones that are going to solve the problems that we have. So I love this, you know, th this humility and trust that has to come from this process. Right. Right, and, and um, this is very much on my mind based on some experiences I've had and since I've been back in Seattle for a couple of months um, and being able to have seen my own future and the opportunities I've been really, really lucky enough to have overseas. And now that I'm about to go back to them, I'm really in a bit of personal crisis about, <laughs> you know, about, about, about what I've learned and where it all fits in. But seriously, um, I've been watching some dear friends who are involved in regulatory activities and community involvement um, here in the United States. And they would answer your observations by saying, well, we do have the um, community involvement group, and it sounds like, Brad, you'd be interested in coming to a meeting of our public <laughs> realm subgroup, which, um, which is comprised of a variety of um, members of, um, you know, a broad set of communities. And I guess what I'm saying is you would 
you'd be getting a lot of very um, equity oriented responses back. And I, I and, and that is so important. And I applaud um, particularly governments that are, are taking that approach and they're taking approaches towards translating and they're taking approaches towards web portals for the people who can't appear at these community involvement meetings. But it's a subtle point. Sometimes as well-intentioned and um, as appropriate as, as these ideas may be, or these constructs might be, they, they aren't that, they're constructs. And we have to be sure that these constructs are still naturally occurring uh, enough that the folks that they are trying to reach will feel comfortable with those constructs. Mm -hmm. And I hope I've said that clearly, but I am really, really learning this um, based on the opportunities that I've uh, been really, really fortunate enough to have that I probably wouldn't have been able to articulate like this if I hadn't been um, running around so much. Hmm. But I do uh, want to ask a, a little bit of a different question here and just okay. the fact that I, I have to confess, I am not a visual person. So like uh, I'm very much a word and analytical person. And so I'm wondering kind of what, uh, if you think that people that experience cities in different ways, uh, if they're more likely to see things or kind of how that, how you've uh, um, come across them. Well, okay. So I've been operating from some research that I did um, that um, there, there are uh, some legendary books with, you know, if you look at this as a planning professional, there's some legendary books like Topophilia and, and others where um, the, the, the five human senses are isolated and the visual sense is characterized as the most important. And so they, guys like you are troglodytes if you can't <laughs> see now. Oh, man. <laughs> but but I've been, right. I, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I've been very, 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 very clear, seriously, that visual is important to many people and maybe even data-driven research would show the role of the visual sense as, as, you know, quite important. But we have four other senses, tactile and olfactory and auditory and whatnot. And, and, and so I encourage people if they don't, if they don't have, God forbid, they don't have a smartphone camera <laughs> or a legacy camera, or they don't want to see, that they see in different ways. And I do talk about a journal, a written journal. I do talk about um, other means, I sketching. You know, some people do this by sketching. And I've been paired with hmm. um, some sketchers in some of the walks we've taken in other cities. Uh, there's a guy in, there's a whole sketching network around the world um, um, of people who, follow some very similar ideas to those that we've been discussing through their pen and a guy named Richard Briggs in Sydney, for instance. Um, um, and so for the, for the folks who are, who are a little more analytical about it, um, they can write, they can do, I've never talked about this, but, if they want to, in my mythical kumbaya world, if they want to contribute with a, quote, urban diary, unquote, that is based on research that they've done of how other cities pursue things, um, then that's just fine. I mean, if, if your response, let's just say that you, let's just say that, that, um, um, my wish has come true and the city of X decides that they're going to allow urban diary submittals for purposes of resolution to a homelessness problem um, or housing affordability problem. Uh, if you wanted to go online and submit uh, research that you had uh, casually determined from a variety of cities 
or if you wanted to write about what you saw rather than simply submit photographs. Um, you know, there are, there are many means of, you know, very me many media that I think you, someone, someone in your shoes could, could utilize. Um, and I, I, I really try and point out everywhere in, in my writing that, Hey, I'm, I'm, mine is visual, but, um, Yours doesn't have to be. Hmm. Well, I'm jealous of you. I must. I'm, I think that's the bottom line. I'm saying that. <laughs> well, I've had other people say <laughs> that. Um, <laughs> well, no, I mean, I'm jealous. I'm jealous of you too. Um, <laughs> um, but I've had no. I've had some people say that um, they can't see the bad. They don't know how to see the bad. They mm. only see beauty. Mm. They only see beauty, and. To them, I say, well, you might want to try and see the bad. You might want to go out on a walk and decide, I'm going to look at, I'm going to look for things that I think are ugly, or I'm going to look for evidence of, of real problems in this city that I don't like. Hmm. And I've said, I, and I've been as, you know, and sometimes you have to, obviously, this goes to my, my friend, the politician and developer point that you can't just ask Mrs. Smith to go out and submit things, you know, you have to give some people some help. And so I've said, well, look, um, I know you don't have time. You don't feel like you really have time to do this on top of the fact that you think you only see beautiful things, um, on your next. And this is one of the, by the way, this is in, in some of the short term urban diary guidance that's out there. Um, on your next trip from work to home or home to work, Look for this. Look for what you don't like and record it in whatever way you wish. If it's a photo, fine. If it's Brad with an analytical construct saying, I have looked at many golden arches <laughs> around the world and this particular McDonald's sign really bugs me, you know, then it's, 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 it's that. Um, and and so you know the I, th I think I think I've somewhat made clear my philosophy about it. Hmm. I, I'm intrigued that you've run into more people that can only see the positive and beauty and can't see the negative. I think it's so often in communities yeah. we see folks that just see the negative and oh yeah yeah no I might have misspoken. It's not that I've seen. I've run into more people. I just had another, I had another friend who actually is a, is a, is an incredible world traveler. Incredible. I mean, some of the stuff he has done and he was the one who said that I, I wouldn't say that. I, I think I'd probably agree with you that in a non-scientific way, there's more people that don't like things than do. But, um, what I'm trying to do, um, is say, show me what you mean. Mm -hmm. Show me what you mean. And, for me, that's visual and it requires a real immersion, but to again, repeat, it can be another form of communication as well. Hmm. Well, I'm wondering kind of to build on this idea, is there, uh, have you found that there are certain people that are more likely to see that there's more than one narrative that's true about a place? Cause I think that that's one of the things that yeah. interests me most is that every place yeah. has many narratives that are true about it, but most of us don't see all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, um, perhaps obviously, um, a variety of people who do this every day as say, even you know, people in the construction industry, people who build, people who develop, people who administer, um, people who design, um, the community outreach consultants I've referenced. I mean, obviously it's, it's, um, going to be clear to them that there's different perspectives because they're going to receive some pushback or some contrasts in their proposals. Um, but there's a sort of inherent human wisdom that comes about as well, because I've been in casual conversation about, some of the things I've been up to and, you know, people will say, Oh, well, gee, doesn't it depend on your life experience, what you see when you go to a place? 
Sure. Um, I don't know that I can isolate any one um, group or profession that is better than others at understanding there's multiple points of view. I think some of us are very dogmatic and um, bottom line and self-oriented. I mean, we're all self-oriented, but, um, uh, and some are inherently more holistic and relational in the way they do things. Um, I don't have a gut level response to that question um, because I've seen, I've seen people from, let's just take architects, you know, in some, in some sense, they have to be aware of different perspectives. For some of them, it's their way or the highway, you know? Um, hmm. I, mean, we, I, I don't mean to attack architects. I'm going to say that <laughs> of, 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 of any, I'm just trying to think of, a, of obviously a, someone who's out there and has to sell her or his approach to a, situation in a city well it's interesting you know i think this this question was brought to mind recently because we had city council elections here in roanoke and you know i think for me the a politician perhaps is the most important person to be able to understand that there are multiple points of view multiple narratives about a place and that but there are other you know there are certain things that you know if you're a, a private real estate developer maybe you don't have to care as much but as a as a urban planner for a city you probably have to care a lot more about recognizing all those different places even if that's not your natural skill set i think that in terms of a you know i think you sort of pronounced a survival approach uh, but <laughs> uh, but i think that quite honestly and the, the some of the best ideas and seeing the better city come from developers mm. and some of the greatest resistance i've had to the ideas in the book come from planners <laughs> True story, um, mm. you know, and, and in terms of politicians, somewhere in between, um, somewhere in between, I think. Um, but yeah, anyway. Hmm. Well, I'm wondering as we kind of get near the end here, when you do go to visit a new place, I'm wondering what are the things that look uh, that you look for when you get off the plane or out of the car that lets you know that a place is doing well or not so well, or whether they be structural, physical or uh, what are the things that you look for that might tip you off one way or the other? Well, as I said earlier, I, I'm tending to look very contextually lately because um, by almost by necessity, I see the recurrence of so many themes in similar cities around the world. And so I tend to look at the, the physical bones of a place and see how the use, the ongoing use or reuse is proceeding. Gentrification is easy to recognize when you see mm -hmm. the the brand label store in an iconic older building. And sometimes that's good because it has been something that, say, Starbucks has done in Europe to um, actually redevelop older structures that might not be otherwise developed and be as cynical as you wish about, about that. Um, globalization, it also has brought back some fantastic old buildings. Um, but you can see that. And I like to compare and contrast um, the old and the new. Kind of do a stratigraphy of place. Um, I, in an article I wrote about why urban history matters, that was about Edinburgh, Scotland. I, as a Seattle boy, took some photos looking back up into the old town, the Edinburgh Castle, and so on and so forth, from the new town, which actually was new in the 18th century, through a slightly out-of-focus Starbucks logo. <laughs> so I like to do that contrast and to show the ongoing change and whether it fits. The other thing I will do is um, certainly look for the signs of some of the major issues that we're all dealing with homelessness um, and how it is that homelessness declares itself in various socioeconomic contexts. Is it different in a society that takes care of 
its people versus a more capitalistic world. Um, what does homelessness look like in Paris um, versus Seattle? And I do illustrate that a bit in Seeing the Better City. Um, you see a congregation of homelessness around um, the Paris Metro exhaust vents where there's heat coming up to the sidewalk. You see, mm -hmm. you see boxes, long boxes assembled for the night and then nicely taken away during the day as sleeping spaces in some very historic settings. Um, homelessness expresses itself around the world in different ways. And it's very important to look at. And that's where I point out that the methodologies I'm talking about are not just taking pretty pictures of a pretty place. Um, I also like to look at um, the intersection of the natural and the built environment, which is forever an issue in an urban mm -hmm. setting. Um, I finally, I'll state something that's very important and that's um, the element of overlaps and overlays of, and there's many of them. There's old and new, there's big and small, there's um, natural and built, there's pedestrian and motorized. Um, if there are sudden juxtapositions when one observes the urban environment, I have posited that that's where the battles are. Mm. And then finally, there's just good old stuff that's easy for a human being to recognize. <laughs> Even troglodytes like you, <laughs> unless you're colorblind, <laughs> color, the impact of color mm. and climate and all of that. Um, the reason that many of these things, going back to the first one, context, are very important is because we're always looking for the quick fixes. And as I said, I think in my first book, um, Cheyenne, Wyoming is very different than um, the Cinque Terre in Italy. Mm. And the idea that you're going to take back ideas from somewhere else is very important and appropriate. And it's part of the urban diary process. But let's be real. Places have different um, contexts. And I've been privileged enough to be working in Sweden in a Nordic environment where when I was there, in um, February and March, it was often, you know, like uh, 16 degrees Celsius below, you know, mm -hmm. below zero Celsius, you know, like eight degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm also working in tropical Australia and tropical urbanism is different than Nordic urbanism, even though it's still people in the built environment. Hmm. Oh, I'll figure out this looking at things thing sooner or later. <laughs> <laughs> I've been very inappropriate in my response to that. You opened your stuff up. You, you opened yourself up to politically and socially inappropriate um, barbs for me, and I apologize for those. Um, anyway. <laughs> well, I, I wonder uh, if you could close us out, uh, perhaps, sure. with a story about uh, what happens when communities really dig in and when they look at themselves, or what can happen when a community yeah. starts to thrive. Okay, so when they look at themselves and, and, and think about thriving or want to thrive or do thrive, um, boy, I think, I think what still resonates with me is I, I wrote a little article in December just a few months ago that um, after running through, you know, from September until December, I was on the road from boy, Cleveland, Ohio, to Washington, D.C., to Seattle, of course, to eight cities in Australia, to four cities in Portugal, to Sweden, to the United Kingdom, and so on and so forth. And I still haven't recovered, and I still mm -hmm. haven't properly analyzed anything that I saw. But I was motivated in the middle of December to write a little piece that was in Plan Edison, and then also picked up by the Congress of New Urbanism, and appeared in a lot of places, and it was called forget smart we need context cities and there's that word again because what i found was that in running around 
all these cities that I was lucky enough to visit and speak in were they were they were trying to keep up with global forces and global pressures and global trends. And so in Portugal, through the great um, sponsorship of a guy named Victor Pereira, who's a smart city entrepreneur and thinker in, in Portugal, and um, uh, a woman named Felipe Cardoso, who edits um, Portugal Smart Cities magazine, Smart Cities Revista, as it's called. I had the opportunity to sort of be on tour as the humanist with some highly tech oriented smart city guys. And we went, we were in, we were supposed to be in Porto, but that didn't work out. We were in Lisbon, certainly, and we were in two other smaller cities in the Portuguese interior. And quite honestly, these cities in the Portuguese interior were struggling about how to retain jobs, just like we, you know, a lot of smaller cities do because they're losing their youth to Lisbon and Porto and, and internationally. And so the tech, the technology companies were in these various sessions that we had, they were really, um, selling is a harsh word, but they were promoting uh, smart city technologies to these places dashboards and monitoring and 5g wireless and all of this and, you know and it's very you know, it's just like everywhere else we have to you know smart cities can better can provide better services they can help the environment they can do you know all all the arguments for data-driven technology and the role in today's cities but there was such a disconnect in the portuguese interior and I saw responses from the audience. How dare you? How dare you talk about this when I don't even have cell phone reception in my village yet? What are you doing? And another gentleman said, you know what? What is a smart city? I go to smart city conferences because I'm supposed to, because that's what I, you know, it's part of my job description. And what is a smart city? Why are we not smart? Why are we not already smart? You're discounting our unique history. You're, you know, why, why are you, and looking at me, telling us what happens in the United States and blah, 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 blah. So at that point, I was motivated to steal the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, you know what? You are absolutely right. And it causes me you know, great emotional turmoil that in a country that set the stage for the exploration of the world and was once, you know, you know, the great Portuguese empire from which we have learned so much. You know, it's like, this is Portugal. You know, you must must honor your substantial history. And I said, isn't it ironic that the American is grabbing the microphone and saying this? And I looked at the technology guys and I said, you guys are acting like Americans, <laughs> you know, stop it. Um, you know, um, you know, please remember where you are. And so that, that remains one of my, hmm. one of my, um, favorite stories because it brings to light all the global forces that are um, that are speaking to urbanized areas everywhere and I don't usually get so visceral um, I need to do my own urban diary about why I, I did that <laughs> but I know why I did that it's just because I was immersing and I was respecting um, what was different and the things that I saw. And I thought it was unfortunate that they were causing this response from people who were actually, and this goes back to what we started with. They were actually people who should have been credited with knowing more 
than individuals that should be receiving a prepackaged response or set of recommendations about how their city should grow or retain jobs or whatever the whatever the element of a thriving community might be. Hmm. Oh, Brings so many different threads together there. That's fascinating. Um, well, Chuck, I really appreciate you taking the time today. Where can people find your books or more about what you're up to? Oh, well, um, thank you. I, I guess um, the both books, um, Seeing the Better City and the initial book, which looked at these fundamental relationships between people and place, no matter where you are in the world, um, both are published by Island Press. And so people could go to the Island Press website. They're both on Amazon, although one precaution about um, urbanism without effort, um, you'll see or people will see an existing ebook um, product. Um, but that's coming out in a revised edition. Uh, later this year, which is something I'm very excited about because it it's kind of going back to the prequel and mm. explaining why the sequel, Seeing the Better City, was written. It's going to have some new verbiage, some new photos, and all of that. So I'm not sure people should look at what they may see out there for urbanism without effort. They may want to wait a little bit while, a, while, a little little while to till the new edition comes out. So, um, and that being said. Um, I try and keep people posted about my renaissance existence at seeingbettercities.com. And there are respective um, websites for each of the book, seeingthebettercity.com. And then there's an older urbanismwithoutefort.com. And I think that's enough information for now. Well, very good. And if you all are interested in learning more about CityWorks Expo, you can find us at cityworksxpo.com. But again, thank you so much for taking the time today, Chuck. Oh, thanks, Brad. It's been a lot of fun, and I really appreciate um, your thoughts and questions. Once again, thank you for listening to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast from CityWorks Expo. We truly hope you've enjoyed today's episode and come away thinking more deeply about something than you were before. If you have, we'd appreciate a rating or review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you might be listening to this. It really helps other people find out about the podcast and the great guests that we have on. Further, I'd like to welcome all of you all to check us out on CityWorksXPO, that's CityWorksXPO.com, and learn about our annual gathering, CityWorks 8, where this year's theme is Anticipating 2050, Acting Today. We're really excited about what we have going on this year and some of the speakers that we have coming in. And we hope you'll join us in Roanoke, Virginia from October 4th through 6th and be part of what's really a very special event. But for now, thanks again for listening and have a great week.